Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to discuss what you need to know about the Marburg virus, including origins of the virus, past outbreaks, transmission, signs and symptoms, and critical complications that can lead to death from this infection. So the Marburg virus is a virus of the family Filoviridae. So if we were to break down the word Filoviridae, the prefix stands for thread-like appearance, and that really denotes the thread-like appearance of the virus itself. It is in the same family of viruses as the Ebola virus. And it is a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus. Again, very key terms here. Negative sense, it's single-stranded, and it's an RNA virus. There are actually two variants of the Marburg virus. One of them is known as Lake Victoria Marburg virus, and the second one is Raven Marburg virus. However, both of them have similar clinical presentations, so we just discuss them as if they are the same virus. Now, the virus was first identified in an outbreak that occurred in 1967 in Germany in Yugoslavia. And here is a map of Germany here, and Yugoslavia would have been a country in this area of Europe. And what is believed to have happened is that there was a species-to-species -species transmission of the Marburg virus from vervet monkeys to humans. So what had happened was vervet monkeys were brought from Uganda, they had had the virus, and they had transmitted to humans in Europe. This was the first outbreak. And during this first outbreak, the mortality rate was very high. It was 25-25% to 25 mortality rate. So a quarter of individuals who became infected died from this infection. And since then, there have been several other outbreaks of the Marburg virus. So the previous outbreaks include the one we just talked about, but more recent ones include a outbreak from 1998 to 2000 in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So here is a map of the Democratic Republic of Congo here. And what is believed to have happened is that men working in an abandoned mine in the DRC were exposed to bats and these bats also carried the Marburg virus. This outbreak was extremely deadly. The mortality rate here was 80 to 90 percent. So eight to nine out of 10 people who were infected with this virus died from the infection. Another outbreak that occurred was in Angola in 2004. So Angola is next to the DRC or Democratic Republic of Congo. It's just southwest of it. And this is actually the largest outbreak of Marburg virus on record at the time of recording this lesson. There were 400 cases of the virus at this outbreak. And what had happened was there was a hospital, a pediatric ward more specifically. So there was a floor of pediatric patients. And there was spread of the virus in this pediatric floor through contaminated transfusion equipment. Again, the mortality right here was very high, 80 to 90%. Now, there's been some recent infections since then, but not to the extent of the Angola outbreak. And most of it has been from tourists being exposed to bats in caves in Uganda. So how is the virus transmitted? The viral reservoir for the Marburg virus are fruit bats of the species Rucetus aegypticus. So here's an image of the fruit bat. Now what is found is that the fruit bats excrete the virus in bodily fluids. So we talked about this before, tourists going into caves in certain areas where these fruit bats reside can be exposed to some of these bodily fluids. And that is exactly how this virus can be transmitted from a bat to a human. So the Marburg virus can be transmitted from a bat to a human. So the human gets exposed to bats and bat fluids. They become infected. And then once the person is infected, they can spread it to other people through horizontal transmission. So this also is through shedding of the virus in bodily fluids. And we've seen this in past outbreaks through transfusion equipment. If there's any contaminated blood that is being given to other people, Contaminated blood products can contaminate and infect other people. So person-to-person -person transmission is possible through exposure to infected bodily fluids. So that's what seems to happen when a person gets infected. They can transmit it to other people through bodily fluids like blood. But when a person gets initially infected, if they're exposed to bodily fluids from a bat, it can be in droplets. 
and the droplets can enter into an individual's mucosal membranes, like the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. So what is the pathogenesis of the infection? So what happens is when an individual does become infected with the Marburg virus through their mucosa, like their conjunctiva of their eyes, their nasal mucosa, and their oral mucosa, the virus enters and infects macrophages and dendritic cells. So the virus gets picked up, usually through phagocytosis, and gets into the cell, entering the cell in an endosome. The virus then can unravel and disassemble, leaving its viral RNA, and then that viral RNA will replicate inside the cell. That viral RNA can then assemble inside the cell in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then that virus is assembled, it gets packaged in the Golgi apparatus, and the virus can then mature and then be released from that infected cell so that it can infect other cells in the body. That's how it enters and replicates and releases to infect other cells. After that, the virus can then disseminate through the lymphatic system. So it can enter the lymph nodes in the lymphatics to spread throughout the body. Now there are several different mechanisms by which the Marburg virus can cause illness and infection. We talked about one of them. It can infect macrophages and dendritic cells. In particular, the macrophages, when they become infected, they can increase the production of chemokines. This leads to a variety of signs and symptoms. Another thing it can do is it can lead to damage to visceral organs like the liver and the spleen. And the Marburg virus can also lead to an upregulation of tissue factor. And tissue factor is the beginning of the extrinsic pathway in the coagulation cascade. It can lead to a coagulopathy. And making more and more fibrin clots in areas where they don't need them will deplete clotting factors. So disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC is a process where fibrin clots are made where they don't need to be made. And there's an increase in fibrin clot formation leading to a depletion of clotting factors. And when we deplete the clotting factors, we won't be able to make clots where we need to make them. And this is exactly what happens in DIC. There's clots where there don't need to be. And then there's no clots where there should be. So we get bleeding issues, and that's exactly what happens in Marburg virus infections. So what are some of the clinical features of the Marburg virus? First, the virus has to incubate. So when it infects an individual, the incubation period is approximately one week. After that one week, there's an abrupt onset of symptoms. These include fever and chills, malaise and weakness, very tired, very weak, Nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea are very common as well, including anorexia, so they have a very low appetite. And they have a very severe headache and bad myalgias or bad muscle pain, particularly of the trunk and the lower back. And what is key to the morbidity of the Marburg virus infection is its bleeding. And we talked about this before. The disseminated intravascular coagulation leads to the depletion of clotting factors and we get excessive bleeding where we don't have clotting factors. And this is exactly what happens. This appears to occur later on in infection. So early on in infection, we don't have this bleeding risk, but later on in infection, we do. And this is where we begin to see issues like mucosal bleeding. So we can see bleeding of gums. We can also see petechia, palpable purpura. We can also see gastrointestinal bleeding like hematochesia and melina. And this is how the Marburg virus infection can be so deadly because of excessive losses of blood. Other clinical findings with regards to Marburg virus infection include a diffuse maculopapular rash, very common in many viral infections. We can also see chest pain and shortness of breath with this infection. And we can see hiccups. This is a very unusual finding, but with regards to a Marburg virus infection, we can see a patient having issues with excessive hiccuping. And the three big ones that can also occur that are also tied with that morbidity and mortality of the Marburg virus infection are confusion, seizures, and coma.
Now, there are particular laboratory investigations you might see with a Marburg virus infection. These include transaminitis. Transaminitis is essentially elevated transaminases from the liver, so increased ALT and AST. Because we talked about this before, the virus can infect and damage the liver. We can also see leukopenia, so low levels of white blood cells, thrombocytopenia, low levels of platelets, and disseminated intravascular coagulation. So the DIC and the thrombocytopenia are tied together. Platelets get destroyed by the DIC process, and the DIC will lead to increases in PT, PTT, and INR. And you'll see decreased fibrinogen, but an elevated D-dimer. So these are all findings you might see with a DIC. So how do we make the diagnosis and how do we treat Marburg virus infections? The diagnosis of Marburg virus can occur through two mechanisms. One is by reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction for detection of viral genetics. So that's one way we can do it. The other one is ELISA for detection of viral antigens. ELISA is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. The treatment of Marburg virus infections is a supportive one. This is a virus. There are no official antiviral treatments for the Marburg virus. It's a supportive treatment where we essentially treat symptoms. And a lot of times we're going to want to try to treat their bleeding risk, so blood transfusions and give them platelets, give them whatever they need with regards to their disseminated intravascular coagulation. There is question of using favipiravir as a possible treatment for Marburg virus. This is in early stages of research at this point. So right now, this is a possible way to treat this infection, but we still have limited data. So most of the time, it's supportive treatment. And there is no vaccine for Marburg virus infections. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn. And I hope to see you next time.